Good morning. My name is Barney Graham. I'm Deputy Director at the Vaccine Research Center at NIH in Bethesda. I'm going to talk about rapid COVID-19 vaccine development today and I want to thank the organizers uh, for this opportunity and thank you all for listening. I'm going to go through emerging viral disease concepts then new vaccine technologies that make rapid response more feasible, stressing structure-based design and platform manufacturing, then uh, consider how that could be used in pandemic preparedness, some about coronavirus biology, the rapid vaccine development process, and end with some comments about vaccine-enhanced disease. This is not the first time we've been through a pandemic. We've had uh, especially this 1918 influenza pandemic in which probably more people on earth died between 50 and 100 million than died in all of World War I. It's an unusual uh, epidemic, uh, at least considered at the time, because not only at the extremes of age were, was there a lot of mortality, but there was also mortality among young adults who developed an ARDS inflammatory condition that was particularly striking in some populations. This is a Native American Eskimo village in Alaska in which of the entire village shown here, there's very few young adults left, a lot of orphan children. The mortality was so high in young people during that outbreak that there was a large drop in the average life expectancy uh, during that year. So we're continuing, uh, we're co we continuously have a, a threat of new emerging infectious diseases. Just a few examples here that have happened during my career. Uh, this is going to continue to happen because uh, of zoonotic hosts that can carry viruses or mix viruses and vector-borne uh, diseases and, importantly, our own travel around the world. We, we travel so much that uh, any disease anywhere on Earth could be anywhere else on Earth uh, within 24 hours. Now, I want to remember that uh, HIV and AIDS is it's itself a zoonotic emerging infectious disease that has been with us now for about 40 years. And uh, I'm going to describe where I work at the Vaccine Research Center because it was founded to develop an HIV vaccine about 20 years ago. We've used HIV uh, driven technologies to uh, work on a number of other uh, long-standing problems uh, that are shown here, influenza, RSV, malaria, tuberculosis, but also to respond to emerging infectious diseases. And it's not just a basic research center, but we're privileged to have also process development, a number of engineers in Gaithersburg, a, a pilot manufacturing plant in Frederick, a uh, self-contained clinic within the clinical center in a laboratory again in Gaithersburg to do GLP analysis of our clinical samples. Over these 20 years, uh, technologies like nucleic acid, uh, uh, gene-based vectors, virus-like particles, a number of different protein or nanoparticle-based designs and monoclonal antibodies have all been made uh, within this system and products have been sent uh, all over the world for testing. And it's run by this group of uh, uh, principal investigators and program heads uh, directed by John Moscola shown here in the middle. So what are those new technologies? What has happened since the emergence of SARS, the original SARS in 2002 and three in the Middle East respiratory syndrome virus, uh, MERS, in around 2012. These are some of the technologies that I think have had a major influence and in transforming effect on vaccinology over the last 12 years. I'm going to focus a lot on structure-based vaccine design today. There's also uh, an enormous contribution now by single-cell sorting, 
capacity for sequencing in bioinformatics that have allowed us to rapidly isolate new human antibodies, to find antibody lineages that have become new molecular targets for vaccine development, especially in the flu program, and the ability to analyze cells on a single cell basis. There's also been major advances in, uh, by protein engineers to create self-assembling particles for uh, display of antigens that I'm not going to cover today, but these technologies have all led to the ability to improve our precision in vaccine design and therefore the quality of antibody and T cell responses that we're able to deliver. Other technologies like rapid DNA synthesis have made synthetic vaccinology concepts possible. And genetic engineering advances allow rapid cell line development and animal model development uh, using um, CRISPR type technologies. And especially for nucleic acids, uh, these kinds of platform manufacturing uh, technologies that involve synthesis and not cell lines have uh, improved our ability to rapidly deliver vaccines. And so these technologies have improved the speed of uh, uh, developing new vaccines. An example of structure-based vaccinology uh, is in respiratory syncytial virus. The F glycoprotein is here shown sitting on a membrane. And in 2013, we were able to solve this pre-fusion structure uh, and demonstrated and discovered a new epitope at the apex of this molecule we call site zero. Very neutralization sensitive epitope and when this molecule uh, spontaneously flips into the post-fusion form, which it does readily, that epitope is lost. And for many uh, decades, this is the molecule that's been used for vaccine uh, de development. And when that is used in pre-immune subjects, you can only boost neutralizing activity by two to three fold. However, after finding uh, and defining the atomic level structure of F by adding a C-terminal uh, trimerization domain fold on, and adding disulfides and cavity filling mutations to stabilize the protein in its pre-fusion state. You can preserve uh, these neutralization sensitive epitopes. And now when you boost subjects, you can achieve a uh, up to 16 fold increase in neutralizing activity, which now uh, has enabled this uh, concept to move forward into advanced uh, testing. The RSVF is a class one fusion protein and shown here again, it's like the F protein of paramyxoviruses and analogous to the uh, class one fusion protein spike on coronaviruses and, and several other envelope viruses of concern. Despite different domain structures, despite different shapes, all of these proteins uh, are uh, uh, framed about the same way and, and have the same basic function. That is, they have endoproteolytic cleavage sites that exposes a hydrophobic fusion peptide that lays next to a, a heptad repeat domain. Second heptad repeat domain is near the transmembrane portion of this uh, fusion machine. And as it starts here in its pre-fusion functional form, something triggers uh, the protein to start rearranging and that allows the hydrophobic fusion peptide to penetrate the host cell membrane. The heptad repeats fold back on each other, ending in this six anti-parallel six helix bundle, non-functional form of the uh, protein. And this creates membrane fusion and a pore that allows delivery of uh, the, the genome of the virus for viral entry. So blocking this uh, function and attacking this molecule is a main strategy for uh, vaccine development against these envelope viruses. So um, as I mentioned, we're facing a, an onslaught of emerging infections that is not going to start. And so the question is, how can we um, get more ahead of this and do this in a more proactive way? There's been a number of strategies developed over the last uh, decade or so. and one of them is a platform manufacturing that I mentioned, and this allows uh, 
increased speed of manufacturing as a pandemic response. Groups like CEPI and WHO have prioritized certain pathogens, either three or eight, uh, trying to um, advance uh, approaches and countermeasures for those uh, that short list. But we've advocated for a prototype pathogen approach in which you can address all the 25 families that uh, are known to infect humans. And even though this is a large problem, we think it is a feasible and tractable problem. Uh, we have a number of licensed vaccines already that cover 13 of these viral families. And even though new technologies for some of these uh, are needed, if we're going to address pandemic threats, uh, there are 12 viral families that infect humans that don't have any licensed vaccines available. If you took the prototype members of these viral families and uh, did uh, the kind of work needed with structure uh, solutions, uh, monoclonal antibodies, understanding replication and tropism and animal models, then taking uh, prototype products through at least phase one clinical trials, we think could put us in a better position to be ready uh, for some uh, potential pathogens in the future. And for the other 80 to 120 or so other viruses within those families that we know can infect humans, we could at least uh, develop uh, concept products uh, through animal models. So we call that the prototype pathogen approach to pandemic preparedness. So coronaviruses um, have been with us for hundreds of years, and there's four endemic coronaviruses shown here, two beta coronaviruses and two alpha coronaviruses that entered the human population. The alpha coronaviruses a few hundred years ago, the beta coronaviruses, um, within the last hundred or so years, OC43 may have been the beta coronavirus that caused the pandemic that occurred in the 1880s. So it's likely that additional coronaviruses will uh, enter the human population over time. And we've already seen that happen in the last 20 years now, three times, starting with SARS-1, then MERS, and, and now the new coronavirus. And so, after the RSV work uh, demonstrated the effectiveness of stabilizing prefusion molecules as vaccine targets, and with the emergence of MERS at, uh, at about the same time, we set out in collaboration with Jason McClellan, uh, uh, a postdoc in Peter Kwong's lab at the time, uh, and in collaboration with Andrew Ward, uh, at Scripps, uh, we were able to solve the prefusion structure of the uh, HKU1 endemic beta coronavirus spike protein. This was uh, lucky in some ways because we would not had luck on either the MERS or SARS spike protein because they were inherently unstable. And HKU1 was an inherently stable molecule and allows us to solve that structure, showing the atomic level details and allowing us to design molecules that would be stabilized. And by adding two proline molecules at the top of the central helix as shown here, you could largely stabilize the HKU1 spike. And uh, luckily these two proline mutations were transposable into the, uh, um, not just the HKU1, but the MERS and SARS resulting in more stabilized uh, molecules that allowed us to preserve these uh, neutralization sensitive epitopes at the apex of the prefusion uh, spike protein. Importantly, not only was it a better antigen in terms of epitope preservation, but stabilizing the spike increased expression from transduced cells by up to 50 fold for the MERS, uh, what we call S2P protein. So this would be an obvious advantage for gene based delivery of vaccine antigens. As I mentioned, uh, solving uh, the stability problem allowed us to uh, identify, solve the MERS and SARS spike structures. And that also allowed us to uh, use these uh, reagents as probes 
to identify new human monoclonal antibodies and to map them onto either the um, N terminal domain as the knob here at the vertex of the spike, and uh, also several epitopes within the receptor binding domain that you see here uh, uh, popping up and also a neutralizing epitope uh, within the stem. So a lot was being learned about MERS uh, antigenicity, and we wanted to ask more about its immunogenicity and looked at this protein in mice and showed that the S2P stabilized version was more immunogenic at lower doses, so it was dose sparing, and also uh, induced higher level responses against a variety and breadth of uh, MERS coronavirus strains. So this uh, stabilized uniform prefusion spike molecule was more immunogenic than the wild type, which was uh, had both forms of post-fusion spike and prefusion, and much more immunogenic than the monomeric S1 molecule. We also showed that this was more protective in mice in the humanized uh, transgenic DPP4 mice in Ralph Barrick's lab, we were able to show that uh, this immunization with this um, stabilized spike could prevent weight loss and mortality in this model. And we wanted to ask, um, how could we use this information to address the potential future pandemic threats? And as I mentioned earlier, you need not only to have a precise antigen design, but you also need a mechanism for rapid uh, manufacturing. And having uh, worked with Moderna during the Zika outbreaks, we uh, decided to work with them on a plan for how to implement the prototype pathogen approach for pandemic preparedness using both MERS and NEPA as uh, prototype pathogens. I'm going to show you the mRNA uh, that we uh, made of the stabilized spike protein uh, delivered and tested in mice here, showing that at very low doses, you could maintain good immunogenicity with high levels of neutralizing antibody that could protect mice against infection. So I'm showing you here if a mice immunized with either 0.1 or 1 micrograms of mRNA. Um, could uh, fully protect uh, lungs from viral replication. And, uh, but at 0.01 a microgram dose, you got breakthrough infection. So it, this experiment proved that mRNA delivery of a stabilized spike could prevent infection uh, and prevent the hemorrhagic disease that can occur in lungs with this uh, challenge model. But importantly, uh, because of this breakthrough, we could ask the question about enhanced disease. So uh, full protection results in protection from weight loss. When you have breakthrough infection on this curve, you can see you, uh, partial immunity leads to partial protection, but the mice do recover. If enhanced disease had occurred in this setting of a subprotective dose, that green line would be on this side of the PBS control uh, group um, uh, with, the, with the display of enhanced uh, pathology and disease. So we found that the spike from multiple coronavirus strains can be stabilized with the same set of mutations, suggesting that this could be uh, potentially a generalizable solution for beta coronavirus vaccine design. And we know that those stabilized prefusion spikes are more immunogenic and protective than the wild type trimers or mono monomeric spikes. So when this uh, new coronavirus emerged near the end of 2019, we uh, talked to our collaborators at Moderna around the 6th of January when it was rumored to be a beta coronavirus. And at the time, we were working toward a clinical trial of an mRNA for a stabilized uh, antigen form of F and G or DEPA. And we decided instead of uh, doing a demonstration project on something that would, would uh, potentially happen, we would convert to the demonstration project on this new outbreak. And so when those sequences were released on the night of January 10th, on Saturday morning, the 11th, we uh, 
took those sequences, um, made modifications to add the 2P mutation, and began uh, synthesizing protein uh, and other reagents that would allow us to begin the vaccine development program. And uh, by doing this, we were able to rapidly attain a homogeneous protein and rapidly solve the spike structure of the new virus shown here. Uh, that was done in collaboration with Jason McClellan, who's now at UT Austin and published uh, just within a few weeks uh, in the early part of, Jan of February. Once we had this spike protein, it allowed us to develop uh, ELISA assays and other uh, diagnostics with collaborators, uh, used it to, uh, as a probe for isolating B cells from convalescent subjects to identify highly potent neutralizing antibodies with our collaborator Abcellera and Lilly, who then ha have taken it into a phase one clinical trial and uh, applied it to vaccines uh, using mRNA in our collaboration with Moderna, uh, but uh, also could be applied in other types of nucleic acid or vector or protein-based vaccines as, as others have done. So um, from the time of the uh, rumored announcement that this was a beta coronavirus and the sequence release, uh, we decided, and Moderna took the risk of manufacturing uh, a GMP uh, lot of product based on our prior work together and uh, the knowledge that we had a uh, stabilizing mutation that was likely to work in this new beta coronavirus. And that allowed them to provide uh, GMP quality material uh, to start a clinical trial within 41 days from sequence release because they were willing to manufacture at risk. And a few weeks later, we were able to start a phase one clinical trial 65 days after we had the sequences. And in the, in the meantime, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we were able to manufacture protein, do elices, start immunizing mice, improve immunogenicity, and solve the structure, which was very important because at the time we didn't have any reagents to uh, monitor or test antigenicity and seeing the structure, knowing that it was uniform and homogeneous gave us confidence that this mutation indeed was stabilizing the protein and the pre-fusion confirmation that we knew would be more protective. So to advance uh, trials, the only reason to go fast here is that uh, if, if you can go fast enough to have vaccine that could um, be a countermeasure before the next winter season when we expect coronavirus to come back in, in a new wave. And uh, to avoid all the morbidity and mortality from that event, uh, we want to try to uh, advance this product as quickly as possible, which means you have to do things in parallel. So our strategy has been to use immunogenicity as a, um, uh, a gate for phase one uh, initiation of protection in animals as a gate for phase two uh, initiation and safety as a way of uh, deciding on uh, phase two B or three initiation. So the phase one trial started in um, March 16th. The phase two trial began uh, based on protection data we had in animals on May 29th. And we're trying to initiate the phase three study uh, on, on the second week of July. Other groups are also advancing vaccines rapidly. Um, here is Moderna, but there are vector-based, other nucleic acid vaccines, uh, subunit-based vaccines, and other vectors, uh, all advancing rapidly. In a, new government program called Operation Warp Speed, trying to organize and facilitate uh, these um, advanced trial, uh, conducting these advanced trials. So we wanna go fast, but we also wanna be safe. And so there are it, there is a history of vaccine enhanced disease that's been described both in coronaviruses and uh, in animal models of, for veterinary coronaviruses and for animal models of SARS and MERS, in which uh, the feline infectious peritonitis virus uh, 
caused, which is a macrophage trophic virus, caused a true antibody dependent enhancement syndrome where FC mediated entry into macrophages increased replication and disease. The other type of uh, uh, enhancement that we worry about is like what happened with respiratory syncytial virus and measles in the 1960s, in which it's now been shown both in some of the uh, tissues from the, the subjects in those trials, but also in animal models, that this had both a T cell and an antibody component in which uh, non-neutralizing antibodies formed immune complexes that precipitated and fixed complement, activated complement in small airways and caused tissue damage, and then uh, have been associated with this allergic inflammation and a TH2 biased immune response. So the mitigation uh, for these kinds of problems, trying to go fast but also be safe, is to make sure you have confirmationally correct antigens, high quality neutralizing antibody to avoid this kind of immune complex formation and also, uh, and to keep viral loads down and then also to, to make sure either through gene delivery or adjuvants to have Th1 biasing immunization. So new technologies are, have transformed vaccinology providing solutions for longstanding problems in emerging diseases. We think that the advent of precision vaccinology with rapid platform manufacturing uh, makes this prototype pathogen approach for pandemic preparedness feasible. And the benefits of rapid COVID vaccine development will require, require judicious uh, advancement while uh, we evaluate the risks of uh, this problem in animal models. Uh, the clinic, the preclinical data in mice will be published uh, or posted online uh, uh, during the week of, uh, during this next week. And so you'll be able to see that uh, monkey studies and the early phase clinical trial results will be published soon after that. So I'd like to thank the people in my lab that I work with every day shown here especially Kismetia Corbett, who led the small coronavirus team uh, generating data on MERS before this outbreak occurred. Caitlin Morabito, who's the project manager for that process, all the principal investigators and program heads of the VRC and other people in NIAD who've made this work possible. I also wanna thank Jason McClellan, who's a long-term collaborator on both uh, RSV in which he, uh, we worked with Peter Kwong uh, and then uh, on coronaviruses after he went to Dartmouth and now at UT. Uh, Andrew Ward for the HKU1 uh, structure uh, and our long-term collaborators, Mark Dennison at Vanderbilt and Ralph Barrick at UNC, who have uh, helped us with our coronavirus work. I also want to thank all these government and non-government uh, organizations who have made this possible. Particularly want to thank our collaborators at Moderna for all their work. Andrea Carfi, especially, who's uh, helped with some of the preclinical animal development and, and the decision by Stefan Bonsell to pull the trigger on GMP manufacturing without any additional experimentation. Uh, so thank you very much, and I'll take any questions you might have at this time. <clears throat> 